Hi everyone, it's Brian from Geometric Evolution. Thanks for watching. If you've been following me, you know that I moved from Da Nang, Vietnam to Quito, Ecuador. Uh, when we moved, it was such a sudden thing that I still had video left over from when I was living in Da Nang. So this video is some of the video I took then. I'm gonna be sharing uh, some behind the scenes of creating an, a, a specific series from start to finish, including my initial inspiration. But before I get into that, if you could, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I'm also asking people to consider supporting me on Buy Me A Coffee. Buy Me A Coffee is a website where people like you can support independent artists just like me. In return, artists share behind the scenes content and perks. For example, for my members, a $5 a month subscription gives my members behind the scenes blogs and videos, first looks at my new creations, and an invitation to my once yearly art sale. Most importantly, you'll be helping me to create content like this and living this crazy artist expat life. With all that out of the way, let's get to the video. Today we're going to talk about my series called Deconstructed Gemstones. It all started relatively early in the permutation series with this piece called permutation number 129. Part of my process creatively is to just jump around. So sometimes I'll make a piece and I'll leave it sit for a long time and I'll go back to it, which is kind of what I, I did in this situation. And that's part of the reason why I have been doing permutations for so long. It really just allows me to play but it allows me to pause and look back and build up on ideas that I've been working on. But to go even further back, let's look at some of my older work before permutations. In 2014, I was working on a series of uh, exploring polyhedral geometric shapes. And at the time I was working on wood panels with oil paint. As tends to be my nature when I work, I wanted to push um, this series a little bit and I uh, came up with the idea of adding this geometric radial line work to it and I came up with this piece. You know, as an aside, I've been calling this geometric line work a polytope and I'm not uh, an advanced student of ge geometry so I don't really know if that's what it's supposed to be called. I did some research a while back and I think that's what it is, but if you know, feel free to leave a comment in the, in the comments below because I would like to know if I'm saying it correctly. So the next evolution after that piece was a series that I did where I added a third sort of um, element and that's this piece here. Um, so I had the polyhedral shape, the line work, and then this sort of black void with minimal white lines. I think these compositions create a really interesting balance of like depth and flatness and minimalism and complexity and it's the kind of thing that I really love to do in my work. So going back to permutation number 129, um, obviously you could see the, the relationship between the two pieces. Um, essentially I took the permutation idea and applied that previous series to this composition. So. I wanted to go and create more of these, as I said, but I, of course, wanted to evolve it further. So that's when I, um, I came up with the idea of using this composition as part of the whole overall composition. This is piece uh, permutation number 308, and it's the first time that I uh, created a polytope that consisted of way a lot of points. And it, as you can see, it's like super complex. So I decided I would take this, the composition in permutation number 129 and add the, the complex polytope of 308. And that's what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna go uh, step by step on how I create these pieces. What I wanted to do was I wanted to create them in tandem because it sort of saves me time, but you'll see. As always, I start with my template. If you look closely, you can see all the points of the permutation around the perimeter. And then you can see the little orange circles where there are points used in creating the polyhedral shape that is part of the design. 
There are also little blue circles that I use for a different star-shaped polyhedral design that I'm sure I'll come back to eventually. Using this template, I pencil out my basic design. After I finish with the pencil, I can be begin creating the polytope line work. In the first one, I ink out the classic permutation line work in the area I've chosen. Pieces in this style require a very particular way of working that's different from some of the other uh, styles of the permutations I create. In some ways, it's very formulaic. Once I make the initial decisions, there's not a lot of spontaneity involved. It requires precise line work, and then precise paint mixing, and then precise paint application. Sometimes permutations can be meditative, but any works where I have to do line work that is blocked out like this, where I skip over areas of the paper, it's not relaxing, because I have to maintain a lot of focus on my pen control. This often makes me tense up. I sometimes suffer from back problems from all the rep repetitive motion from creating these complex geometric patterns, and it's often exacerbated if I'm tense while I do these movements. I've noticed it's not as bad as it used to be, which is definitely gratifying. I like to make references to other artists, like famous artists, when I make my videos. Um, but it, this series, I don't really know who I could point to to say I had a direct influence. It's just sort of like a very big amalgamation of all of my training. A while back, I did a pretty in-depth video about modernism, which encompasses a very broad swath of art, his art history. Although geometric abstraction falls into the period of modernism, I can't really think of an individual artist that I would compare this work to. I think I will always at least partially think of Piet Mondrian, who I've always said it has been a big influence. Although using both very differently, the use of color and geometry could be seen as having some relationship. As I mentioned, I decided to create several pairs of these compositions, one in the original style and the second in a newer variation. The big benefit of this is that I can double my output of pieces using the same mix of paints. Believe it or not, mixing the subtle variations of colors in this monochrome style is one of the most time-consuming parts of the process of making these pieces. So it's nice to be able to make two and only have to mix paints once. As I'm inking, it makes me think about the fact that I could, if I wanted to, create full, a full permutation line work shape and then go over it with a paint, but that seems like a waste of ink and time. And I should also mention that it's also a waste of the nib of the pen. The tips of these pens are so fine that they degrade, and I'm pretty sure I often run out of the pen tip before I actually run out of ink. I've gotten better over the time, I think, I try to have as light a, as a touch as I can. The, hard, the more pressure you put on, the more it pushes on the nib. So um, the, less the less textured the paper is better, so I try and use very smooth paper. Um, and I used to do a lot of work on wood, and sometimes a pen, a pen would only last for one piece. And on a large piece, I'd go through more than one pen just on one piece. As I'm making these pieces, I want to batch my processes. And what I mean by this is I want to execute each step on each piece at the same time, rather than completely finishing a piece and then starting over from the beginning on, this, on the next one. The different pro processes require different sides of my brain, so it's just easier mentally to do that. So now since I finished inking the, the classic permutation shape, I'm going to do the complex one. The basic composition of these two pieces is identical, so I've gotten a little bit, little bit of practice, but the higher complexity means I just have to pay extra attention. Okay, so after the initial pass, I'm not really satisfied with the complexity, so I start a second pass. So now that the inking is done, I could paint the sides of the polyhedrons on both pieces. I start from the lightest color and go to the darkest. 
I used to use a flat brush for this, but over time and experimentation, I found that using a very small round brush is easier and leads to fewer mistakes. I'm pretty happy with the crispness of these edges, uh, but I will use my pen to define them before I'm finished. But first, I will add the black. I use a jet black Holbein acrylic gouache for the black. It creates a very deep and matte black. It barely reflects any light at all, and I love it. The last components are these white lines. I use a 0.08 gauge white Sakura Jelly Roll gel pen for these. Um, I do this in the process last because the black paint can be very sensitive, so I want to avoid touching the piece as much as possible once it dries. So that was my process for creating my mini series called Deconstructed Gemstones. Thanks for watching it. By the way, a bunch of these designs are available at, on items in my Threadless store. You can get like bags or um, greeting cards or stickers, stuff like that. Uh, I'll leave the link to that in the description below. I hope you found this video interesting and if you have, again, remember to give me a thumbs up. Um, and I hope it's a little bit more interesting than just doing a little time lapse of how I made things and you got some uh, insight into the way I think about how I work. If you've made it all the way here, you're a really special person and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And of course, if you'd like to support me further, please consider uh, becoming a member on my Buy Me A Coffee. Again, the link is in this, the description below. It would mean a lot to me. And with that, we're gonna end things. Um, thanks for watching so much and I'll see you next time.